Hello there, and welcome to Just the Discs. We talk about Blu-rays here. My name's Brian, and today we are talking about a bunch of films from imprint films uh, in the wonderful land of Australia. These are imports. These are region-free discs. I just want to let people know up top. And one of them is probably one of my favorite releases of the year so far. I'm going to start... Uh, right up top with that and that is Barfly uh, Barbara Schroeder's film from uh, 1987 starring Mickey Rourke Faye Dunaway uh, produced by Francis Ford Coppola and Canon Films probably one of if not the best film that Canon ever produced you know you could say and it is an autobiographical film written by writer and poet Charles Bukowski based on, I think I've heard three days of his life or thereabouts when he was about 24 years old. And the plot is that you have a character stand in for Bukowski played by Mickey Rourke who literally <laughs> doesn't really work, hangs out in bars and writes and you know starts to encounter different people and one of the things he often does is he gets in fights with one specific bartender at one specific bar this is an LA based movie uh, there's a few different LA bar locations used he gets in a fight with a bartender played by Frank Stallone brother of Sly Stallone uh, who's very good in this movie as the antagonist a real jerk um, and it's an ongoing thing. The movie basically opens and, spoiler alert, closes with bar fights between the two of them. And Rourke is just incredible as this guy. Like, he has this um, sense of hating people. There's a great bit of dialogue when he meets Faye Dunaway's character about <laughs> how they don't care for people. They, like, he says something like, I'm just happier when they're not around. And I've always remembered that line and always remembered his performance in this movie. It is both, um, you know, very sarcastic. Sort of sarcastic isn't quite the right word. It's it's something else. It's just, it's just a guy kind of flowing through life. Not like the dude. Like this guy and the dude would not get along, you know, in terms of Lebowski. But it is an interesting... Um, slacker type lifestyle I guess if you want to call it that but it's really wonderfully portrayed by Mickey Rourke he is both sympathetic and unsympathetic he is intelligent and does some really things that are you know what you might call self-sabotage and he's just fascinating in this role again one of his best performances ever and Barbie Schroeder the director uh, does a wonderful job with this and this was a real pet project for him he was just a big fan of Bukowski had to call him up like several times to even get him to agree to let a movie be made let alone get this off the ground uh, there's also a great story about how he went into Canon Films and said he would cut off one of his fingers if they didn't let him make this movie and there's even some note at some point about him actually having Novocaine up like one of his fingers so that he was going to do it he's going to cut it off with like a kitchen uh, carving knife or something. I don't know. Anyway, um, it's a fascinating film. It's a cult item, but it is one of those movies that you watch and it's just sort of about life and philosophies and it's sort of downbeat, but it's also life affirming. It's just got this incredible combination of elements that I just don't think I've seen in too many other films. And it uh, has a good supporting cast. Um, I mentioned Mickey Rourke, Faye Dunaway, both are uh, sort of alcoholic barflies that meet each other and have, you know, their own sort of issues. And you have Alice Kriege as a publisher trying to track down and work with um, the Mickey Rourke character. You have Jack Nance, who is a detective in this, trying to help the Alice Kriege character. Frank Stallone, Pruitt Taylor Vince in an early role. Um, Sandy Martin, who is Napoleon Gra uh, Dynamite's grandma, has an interesting part in the movie. And, um, yeah, it's, it's just really good stuff. Uh, I'm a big fan and he, 
like I said, Rourke is just transformed here. He is a whole different guy. It's and he moves even in this like crouchy, almost like waddle. It's a different physicality completely than, and he has sort of, he has sort of this underbite with his jaw, this thing he does sort of. That's crazy. I mean, all of it is just like like I said, a transforming a performance. He lives in a disgusting, run-down apartment, goes out to the bar and drinks and gets in fights with a bartender, goes back to his apartment, writes prose. At one point, he comes back from the bathroom in his apartment, and he goes into the wrong apartment, and he realizes it, and then he raids the fridge for bologna and bread and, like, a bottle of booze. And anyway, uh, fascinating stuff. And this set is wonderful. This is a two-disc set in the classic... um, imprint films box where you take the top off and then you have your two films your two blu-rays inside and so you have your barfly disc and you always have the inside artwork and everything like that which is cool year on the side um, okay, I'll talk about this in a second because it's not a glorified extra. It's a whole other thing. Um, but in terms of the extras on this Blu-ray, and this film has gotten a release, I, I want to say there's like a French import, but this is by far the best release of this movie that ever has been, and that's really exciting because the movie has a lot of fans, and it's been MIA on Blu-ray. Re- I mean, like I said, there's an import. I own it, but this is head and shoulders above that. Um It has a commentary by Barbie Schroeder, and he goes into great detail about the seven years it took him to make this project and how, uh, you know, his approach to getting Bukowski on board, and he has Bukowski stories and stories of production. It's a really nice commentary. And then there's a second commentary, which is really cool, too, uh, by Kim Cooper and Richard uh, Chave uh, of Esoteric Tours Los Angeles, and they are historians and professionals. preservationalists and they give like Bukowski tours you know of the bars that still exist that he used to go to and other haunts and so they have a lot of information about all the bars that you see in the movie there's a montage at the beginning of the movie of different bars and they actually go like this one's open this one's closed that one's closed a lot of them are actually closed unfortunately but it's a great survey of not only the story and the characters but also the locations that are so much a part of this movie. And so it's a really neat um, thing to have both of them on this commentary. I really enjoyed that. Um, then you have High Society, an interview with Alice Kriege, which is about 19 minutes, 42 seconds. She, again, I said she plays a publisher, that's magazine publisher that's trying to get uh, involved with Bukowski, the Bukowski surrogate uh, played by Mickey Rourke. And she talks about her history as an actor, some experiences preparing for the film, there's a really serious fight between her and another woman in the film. I'm not going to spoil, but I guess there weren't a lot of stunt doubling happening there. So when you see that fight, you know that that's a lot of real um, actors doing that. Um, this piece is produced by Jillian Wallace Horvat and Elijah Drenner and edited by Elijah Drenner, friend of the channel, friend of mine, a uh, guy who does a lot of great stuff for these pieces. And so does uh, Jillian. Um, really wonderful producing editing duo and they worked on the um i think a few of these other pieces here um next we have another round which is a frank stallone interview about 13 minutes and 47 seconds very entertaining interview from frank stallone who opens by saying you know he plays a bartender in the movie but he can't mix drinks at all he has no clue about that and he says he's more known for being a musician which i didn't even know um and that Mickey Rourke wanted him for the role specifically and even went so far as to threatening the producers to walk off the movie if Frank Stallone wasn't cast. Um, And he said he wasn't aware of Bukowski before the movie started, so that's interesting. Um, He talked about the extras in this bar in the movie and how all of them were like ex-cons and one in particular, this old, wispy-haired man had done like 27 years for killing his wife and I won't go into the details of the, I think he killed the wife's lover. I don't know, but there's, there's, um, 
death involved, and it's a, a fascinating story. Uh, other stories about Faye Dunaway wanting, you know, having a, at least a few makeup people that were part of her entourage and how Barbe right away was like, no, 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 you can't, no makeup for you. And and to her credit, I guess she comes in with no makeup and it really does make a difference in terms of the character. She looks sort of run down and, you know, definitely not no makeup, definitely sort of dirty, unwashed hair. I mean, she she really goes all in and it's a, a good performance by her for sure. Um, Frank still is talking about stealing from Pacino and Scarface and uh, he talks about the fight scenes a little bit and it's it's a really fun interview I really enjoyed it again produced by Jillian Wallace Harvett and uh, Elijah Drenner and edited by Elijah camera and sound by a friend of the channel Jim Coons which is great um, but yeah I've totally dug this interview and then another one called to all my friends which is an interview with Eva Gardos who's the editor uh, about nine and a half minutes, and she talks about her beginnings in film, editing Shockwaves, the Nazi zombie movie, uh, worked with Hal Ashby on one of his last films, then did Valley Girl with Martha Coolidge, then uh, Mask with Peter Bogdanovich, and a, has a Bukowski story that he saw at Dailies and that he had um, seen one take where Mickey Rourke got off, got off from the bar and left half a beer on the bar. And he was like, I would never do that. I would never leave a drink on the table unfinished because a lot of it is about, you know, bumming drinks, getting drinks from people, using your money to get the most drinks for your buck. Um, but it's a very fascinating interview, and she seems like a real cool person in terms of her career and her process. Uh, also produced by Jillian Wallace Horvat and Elijah Drenner and edited by Elijah. Hats off. Again, this is one of my favorite releases of the year and a lot of it has to do with the movie but it also has to do with the features that are here and how well um and how much information you can glean from them uh there's another one called i drink i gamble and i write the making of barfly which is a vintage um sort of featurette and it's about 12 minutes it has interviews with bukowski and he says uh i hate movies and Barbie Schroeder talked me into doing this and uh, and then the story about cutting off the finger and there's interviews with Mickey Rourke, Barbie Schroeder, Fred Roos, who obviously worked with Coppola uh, and in, it was involved in producing this film. So that's all on this disc and Transfer looks good. I was really happy with that, but that alone is great. On top of that, you then have an entire another disc and it's another movie. It's a documentary of sorts because it's so long uh, called The Charles Bukowski Tapes. And altogether, it is more than four hours of Barbie Schroeder doing about 52 separate short interviews. Each one of them starts and ends with a freeze frame. And these interviews are with Bukowski. I should have led with that. Um, it's like they'll have like a little piano interlude and a freeze frame of Bukowski. And he asks him like one question and he'll go off on that one question for however long. He'll tell a story. He has amazing stories. And I could watch four more hours of this. Honestly, it's just incredible to listen to uh, Bukowski talk. And you get why Barbie Schroeder was fascinated with him and why he wanted to make this movie. Uh, but it is just incredible. Uh, so it shot on video, so not you know crazy quality, but great stories and uh, absolutely wonderful to watch. Um, I mean, he talks about his disinterest in an, you know, nine to five job lifestyle. He'll, sometimes he'll read a passage of his writing and talk about it. Um, there's scenes of him talking to his then wife and getting kind of animated with her, which is a little weird in some spots. Um, but you get to see the dynamic of their relationship play out in some of the interviews. He's, there's one where he's driving in a car, giving a running commentary, uh, down Hollywood Boulevard and he's talking about he's anti-drug but pro-alcoholism alcoholism and why. I mean, there's t just so much information and stories and all these interviews. I just loved it. It's really, really great stuff. Like this, this doc would be like a new discovery for me for this year and that may come up later on the podcast at some point. Uh, I noticed he's having a drink in just about every single interview of the 52 
and sometimes he's drinking and smoking. Uh, but it just gives you a true sense of what it's like to hang out with Charles Bukowski, and it's fascinating. So, like I said, one of my favorite releases of the year. Kudos to Imprint Films for knocking it out of the park with this one. You know, I mean, they did The Warriors already this year, and that was great. That would be another one that would be on my list. But Barfly, really, really amazing stuff and a great film. So that's first. Um, then next up we have Blue Chips from 1994, directed by William Friedkin. This is a basketball movie, a college basketball movie. And it is uh, sort of a look at a a struggling Los Angeles-based fictional college team coached by Nick Nolte, who's great in this movie and who opens the movie in a really interesting way. And I, I like that it goes this way because it's sort of different than a lot of sports movies you'll see. And that is the fact that Nolte's character, we open on the locker room with the college team in there. Nolte's character comes in and just berates them. Just no inspirational anything, just kind of lays into them. And I can't remember if he starts throwing stuff in the first basically he leaves and everybody sort of breathes a sigh of relief and he comes back and he berates them some more and then he might throw something because he's just so frustrated with the team and all this um and apparently this is based on the whole character is very much based on um ncaa coach bobby knight uh who i'll get into him a little bit more later but he was you know best known as the coach of the indiana hoosiers from 1971 to 2000 also, also coached Texas Tech. Three NCAA division tournaments, 76, 81, 97. Five Final Four appearances, 73, 76, 81, 87, 92. Just a really <laughs> renowned figure in college basketball, but was also a uh, hot-tempered guy and, you know, very animated, we'll say. And he actually makes an appearance in this film, so that's kind of fascinating in and of itself. Um, but the story centered around... Western University Dolphins, which is this, again, fictional Los Angeles college basketball team and how the team is sort of struggling and needs some new talent and how the college scene in the 90s is very much pervaded by a lot of schools underhandedly uh, bribing players to come to play for them because of all the lucrative contracts for television that these schools can get and all the money they can make. Um, so they're bribing high school players who are about to join the ranks of college. And Nick Nolte's character does, is not into that. He doesn't want to bribe anybody. He wants to do it the right way. And so he is sort of at a disadvantage and he has to sell his program and his, you know, school and what he has to offer these players. So there's like three like candidates blue chips return sort of refers to the blue chip the high um profile folks that you want to get on your team so he has three athletes he's trying to get on his team two of them are definitely being courted by other teams and maybe bribed and who knows if he can get them but the third is a guy he finds since i think rural really rural louisiana if i recall and he's played by shaquille o'neal who's good in this movie very good uh, and but he's a real rough around the edges player. I mean, obviously Shaquille O'Neal, seven feet plus, really tall guy. Great, we know to be a great basketball player. But this character is set up as a guy who has rarely been coached, very raw talent, but you know has the potential to really be great if you can get him to the place he needs to be to play college basketball. So that's a lot of what the focus of the movie is: is that stuff, uh, finding him and you know, kind of where it goes from there. And there's some other ins and outs of college ball that come into it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things about the movie and the way it's filmed. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but supporting cast includes Mary McDonnell as Nolte's wife, very supportive, very helpful to the Shaquille O'Neal character. JT Walsh as an aggressive booster. Who's really trying to push that they do bribe people and that they do get these certain players in and all this. Uh, there's a, uh, sports writer played by Ed O'Neill, which is cool. It's written by Ron Shelton, who I think is one of the better sports film filmmakers out there. He did things like Bull Durham, White Men Can't Jump, Tin, Cup, which I love, uh, and Cobb. 
And he wrote The Best of Times, which is a great old guys looking back at their high school days sports movie. And he, he's done a ton of great stuff, but I'm a big fan of his work, especially Tin Cup. I, I just adore that movie. Um, and so he's really great at writing sports movies and just setting the drama up right, making them feel realistic in terms of the interactions and the just the, the mechanics of the sports stuff, you know, really works. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a really solid you know, basketball movie and underrated, I think a bit, you know, uh, back from 1994. Um, in the, in the extras, we have a nice commentary from, uh, Bilga Abiri. And he talks in depth about the film's production and using real players instead of actors. In most cases, real audiences reacting to the games. Like they had real people brought in to react to the games and that gives it a different energy, um, using multiple cameras, talking about Nick Nolte basing his character on Bobby Knight and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's really nice commentary, and I absolutely dug that. Uh, we have some featurettes here. We have uh, Finding Your Way, a 13-minute, 35-second interview with the editor, Robert K. Lambert, and he talks about coming up as an editor, working on documentaries, then ending up working with Friedkin as a co-editor on Sorcerer, and he actually cut the bridge scene in Sorcerer, which is pretty a pretty big deal. One of my favorite sequences in a movie ever, and so obviously a guy really knows what he's doing. Um, but yeah, he talks about the experience working with him on this film, using multiple cameras in some of the uh, ball game sequences and other stuff. Really nice interview. Then we have Painting Blue, which, uh, which is an interview with the DP um, Tom Priestley Jr., it's about 15 minutes and 51 seconds. Talks about how he came to be a DP. Talks about working as assistant cameraman with Friedkin on The French Connection, some of the car chase stuff, which is really cool. The Exorcist and um, his methodology for shooting this movie. Uh, again, really, really interesting to hear the process and you know between the editor and this guy, two gentlemen who've worked with Friedkin you know, and some of his earlier stuff and it was neat to hear their takes on that uh there's also a featurette called we don't buy athletes illegal recruiting in the ncaa which is an interview with sports journalist ben strauss about eight and a half minutes and he's the co-author of the book indentured the inside story of the rebellion of the ncaa and he talks about the ins and outs of college basketball and the recruitment practices therein and the dynamics at play in the world of college basketball it's just a really interesting chat about how things work and it kind of pl plays back to his book a little bit, but, but a cool interview with, with a journalist about it. So that is blue chips. Moving right along. We have Lolita from 1997. This is Adrian lines adaptation of the Vladimir Nabokov uh, novel from 1955, which was previously adapted by Stanley Kubrick in 1962 with James Mason in the Humbert Humbert role and Sue Lyon in the Lolita part, and Shelley Winters in the mother of Lolita part. Um, and this movie's interesting because I don't remember this being set up quite as much in the Kubricks, but it, it's been a minute since I've seen that, so I'll be, to be fair. But at the beginning of this movie, I, for those that don't know, it's about uh, a guy who moves into a boarding house with a woman and her daughter who's 14, and he becomes obsessed with the 14-year-old daughter. So it's really racy, uh, taboo kind of stuff. Um, you know, plays even more so now than... I mean, it, it, it's, always, it's always been a very taboo uh, story. But what's interesting is that it opens with a story that Humbert Humbert tells about being 14 years old himself and meeting another 14-year-old girl and falling for her and her being basically his first love and having this really formative effect on him. And then I think several months after they really sort of started to get involved, she dies of typhus. And it just destroys him. And he says something about how it froze him in time in some ways. And it's not to certainly justify the character's attraction to a 14-year-old girl but it's trying to set up the psychology at play in terms of why this guy is so drawn to Lolita. And ultimately it's about uh, remembering this girl from when he was a kid and sort of being able to, I guess, relive that in a way 
Uh, but it is a very dark movie, and it's much more explicit than the 1962 version could be at the time. So it's you know it's relatively uncomfortable in spots, but really well performed by Jeremy Irons, who plays Humbert Humbert in this, and Dominique Swain, who plays Dolores, aka Lolita, in this film. Her mother's played by Melanie Griffith, and yeah, it's uh, it's over two hours long and. Uh, Frank Langella plays the Quilty character that Peter Sellers played in the original film, and he's fascinating in this as well. But yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a tough watch, but it is very powerful and very well performed, and an interesting alt take <clears throat> on this material that Kubrick did himself uh, way back. So um, on this disc, you have a commentary by Adrian Lyne, which I think comes from a DVD. Um, good, but a little sparse in some spots, uh, a commentary by film critic, Josh Nelson, which is very more, um, packed with information. And I, I definitely dug him. I like the commentaries he's done with Alexandra Heller Nicholas. They're a great duo. Here's a solo track from him. Very cool stuff. Uh, there is an interview with the cinematographer, a very lengthy interview, uh, cinematographer Howard Atherton. And it's called An Exhausting Film, so that gives you a sense of his experience on the movie. But it's about 42 and a half minutes long. So it's a really lengthy interview with the DP of this film, talking about the making of and his involvement of it. Then there's The Seduction of Humbert, um, a Amer- Adrian Lyne's American Beauty, a video essay by Kat Ellinger, uh, 28 minutes. Then you have casting sessions with uh, actors Jeremy Irons and Dominique Swain, 11 44 11 minutes 44 seconds actual casting tapes of the two actors reading together which is really interesting and the thing i'll say about dominique swain is she's incredibly effective in the role and i think a good part of it is her physicality again speaking to the back to the um mickey rourke performance in barfly she just like throws her body around in this way that i believe she was 17 at the time she made the film she's playing 14 and she's really I think it's tricky sometimes when an older actor plays younger and really tries to kid it up, if you will. And I feel like she does a really good job of the physicality of it, just throwing her body around like a little kid does versus how, you know, as, as certain people get older, they move a little bit more gracefully as they age. They're not as, I don't know, there's something about the physicality of it, the way she performs it. But she's very good in the film, and it's interesting to see the um, the auditions here. Uh, in addition to that, you have an on-set featurette, which is about eight and a half minutes long, and eight deleted scenes. Um, I don't think this has been on Blu-ray yet. Um, and so this is a nice um, new version of it. And then blue chips, I forgot to show the... I always like that the covers are different and that the interiors have the pictures. And then just a few more here. We have um, Durs Azula. This is a uh, Akira Kurosawa film, a later film from him from 1975. And it is about a group of... well, sorry, it's about a military explorer that meets and fr- befriends uh, Goldie Man in Russia's unmapped forest, and a deep and abiding bond evolves between the two men, um, one of them civilized in the usual sense and the other at home in the glacial Siberian woods. So it's very much a Kurosawa slow burn character study, uh, and it is, you know, another... It's just two hours and 21 minutes, so it really takes its time playing out. Uh, stars Yuri Solomon, Maxim Munzuk, and others. And I think a lesser seen, lesser appreciated Kuro Kurosawa film. Um, and a nice release from, from Imprint here. We've got a lot of features on this one, uh, including uh, an audio commentary by Japanese film expert Stuart Galbraith. Uh, mapping Kurosawa: History of Dursazula, a film uh, uh, with film writer and historian Michael Brooks. Uh, Sound of the Taiga, a video essay by music historian David Schechter on the score of the film. 
actor Yuri Solomon on the writer Vladimir Arsenev, actor Yuri Solomon on director Kurosawa, actor Yuri Solomon discusses the film himself, making the film a short documentary and archive footage of the real Vladimir Arsenev, as well as the U.S. trailer. So a really nice Kurosawa movie that I don't think has had a ton of releases on Blu-ray, if any. And uh, so if you're a Kurosawa fan, this is something you're going to want to grab. I haven't seen a good Kurosawa release. I guess a lot of his stuff's been done already, so that's part of it. But I was excited to see that as part of the group. Uh, next up, we have one called Harem. Now, this is a movie I hadn't even heard of until this release. It's from 1985. It's directed by Arthur Jaffe. stars Natasha Kinski and Ben Kings- Kingsley. And it's about... Um, well, the synopsis is Diane is a sophisticated trainee on the New York Stock Exchange who is suddenly kidnapped and held captive in a North African desert hideaway by Selim, an Arab mogul. Um, so it's a really kind of strange movie, um, but one that somehow had slipped by me completely, this idea of this... I mean, it's not quite a full two-hander, but it's more or less a lot of Kinski and Kingsley together, and I love both those actors. So it was intriguing to see that... Um, kind of thing played out and somehow again I had completely missed it so I was excited I this one definitely hasn't had a blu-ray that I'm aware of um it has audio commentary by author Scott Harrison Lost Girl the 70s and 80s cin- cinema of Nastasia Kinski video essay by Kat Ellinger very cool stuff there in terms of an overview of her work uh and a German trailer as well so that is Harem from 1985 a forbidden love story um, and then one more, we have The Road Home, which is by Zhang Yimou, who, if you follow Imprint, you know they put out the collaborations box set, their epic box set of the cinema of Zhang Yimou and Gong Li. Um, and so this is another Zhang Yimou film. This one is about, uh, it says, prompted by the death of his father and the grief of his mother, a man recalls the story of how they met in flashback. So sort of an epic romantic story um, directed by Zhang Yimou. And so if you have that box set, here's another movie to add to your collection from Imprint. And this one uh, doesn't have anything in the way of extras, if I recall. Yeah, just the film itself, but... um, still uh pretty cool to have this if you're a fan of his work and you got that box set and you want more so that's the road home just wanted to make you all aware of that one and that'll do it for this round of imprint films blu-rays lots of good stuff here again can't recommend barfly highly enough uh that is one for the books as far as i'm concerned definitely check it out try um you know, imprint CDs if you want. You could try Orbit DVD or Diabolic DVD. They may carry it. Amazon US will eventually carry it if you're in the States. Uh, but it is highly, highly recommended by me and will definitely be my list of favorite releases of 2022. So thank you for watching and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.